This morning, I want to start off by telling you that, that remodeling is nothing new to Jesus. Man, he knew what remodeling was all about because he grew up as a very humble carpenter in the country. I bet most of you didn't know that. Jesus was a country boy. I guarantee it, Jesus was about as redneck as they come because he grew up way back in the hill country, way, 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 way outside of town, and he was a carpenter's son. So he grew up in his dad's shop, and man, he would get his hands dirty. He had calluses. He cut himself, and he had all sorts of bruises and from he was a rough dude he was a tough dude so anybody who tells you Jesus was a sissy they don't know what they're talking about because Jesus was a country boy look at somebody and say Jesus was a country boy that didn't sound very convincing. But the truth is, he really, really was. And man, he knew what it meant to remodel. He knew what it meant to take old things, just like the video that you saw, and make those things brand new again. And God, his father, sent him on a mission to do the very same thing with people's lives. He came to remodel religion, not just furniture, not, not just things that he built with his hands, but Jesus came to remodel your life by remodeling religion, okay? Totally and completely awesome. Totally awesome what he's done for you this morning. You know what the amazing thing is, is when Jesus came to this earth, even from the time he was a baby, and especially by the time he was 12, he would go into the temple and he would begin to teach. And the, the Pharisees couldn't understand, like, you haven't even been through school, and yet you know more than we know about the law. And that's because Jesus knew from the very beginning what his purpose was in incoming. And, you know, when you go to build something, you have blueprints. How many of you guys have ever seen blueprints? They're those crazy big rolls. Like, I could pull down the Mountain Movers Church ones, and when we first got them from the architect, it cost $5,000 for this big roll of papers. You roll it out, and it's incredible details about how every inch of the building is to be built to specs. Jesus knew what the blueprint said when he came to this earth. He knew every single piece of the puzzle. He knew what he came to do, and the amazing thing was, is that as he was doing everything he had came to do, he knew I'm getting closer to the end. I'm watching the project and I'm coming close to the end. But the disciples, they had not seen the blueprints. The disciples did not know what the end project looked like. See, Jesus the whole time knew that yes, he would go to the cross, but in three days he would raise again. And when he did, then he could take people back into a real relationship with his father, which was why he came to earth in the first place. But the disciples, if you remember last week as we had Palm Sunday, you know, the disciples followed Jesus as he came down Jerusalem's road. And everybody's waving their palm branches and they're so excited. Jesus has declared himself king. But what they didn't understand is why, after he declared himself king, did he tell them at the Last Supper, I'm going to be led like a lamb to the slaughter? They were all puzzled. It didn't make any sense. Why would you be led as a lamb to the slaughter? That's what the high priest is going to do with the lamb. What are you talking about? They couldn't grasp it. Then that night, he goes out to the garden to pray. And as he goes to the garden, he tells them, he says, hey, come and pray with me. And as they go out to pray that night, you know, the disciples fall asleep, which, how can you be critical? We'd have probably done the same thing. <laughs> when you go to pray all night long, you know, you're tired. And, and so they lay down, and Jesus three times comes to him, and he's like, come on, guys, can't you just pray with me for one hour? And they fell back asleep. And it wasn't very long, but Judas came, and he kissed him, that kiss of death. And as that happened, the soldiers began to arrest Jesus. And as he was arrested, the disciples were so incredibly confused because they thought, just days ago you declared yourself king. Now you're being arrested and walking out of here in chains. And they all fled, scared out of their minds, even though they had watched as Jesus laid out those blueprints, as he did the miracles, as he fed the 5,000. They saw all of that, but yet they fled in that very moment because here's the deal. They couldn't see the end picture. Had they known what the end was, they might have hung around, but rather they fled. Jewish leaders had it out to kill Jesus because he was ruining their business. He was bad for business. They were making a lot of money doing what they were doing, and he was wrecking what they had built and trying to remodel it to something different, the religious system altogether. And so they did not like him at all. They couldn't deny the fact that he was performing all these wonderful miracles all over the countryside. So everybody knew that he was a man of God of some kind, but they would not, they would not acknowledge that he was the Son of God. But the time had come that God had let his son 
presented his son to basically humanity to be sacrificed. I want you to turn with me to Matthew 27, 26 through 54. I'm going to read this text to you. It's a little lengthy, but I think you're going to enjoy it. If you have your word, you can follow me there, uh, or you can follow me up here. Before we read this, let me pray over today's message. Father, we are so grateful this morning for your life-changing, powerful word that has changed my life in such a tremendous way, and many, many lives that have, flown, uh, that have uh, flooded through this church in years past and are even sitting in this sanctuary today. I pray that that same life-changing power that rescued and raised Jesus from the grave and, and is captured in your word would infiltrate our lives today that we would leave this place totally different. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Matthew 27 and verse 26 begins with this. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and they called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a, a, a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt down before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and they grabbed the stick and they struck him on the head with it. Then they were finally tired of mocking him, and they took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with vinegar or bitter gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. It read this, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. Well, in verse 45 it says, At noon darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. At about 3 o'clock Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him and a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that very moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple, this is so cool, was torn right in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split apart and tombs opened up. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. Tell me that did not freak them out. <laughs> Saw a bunch of dead people walking around town. Craziness. You know, at that moment, they had to have been saying to themselves, Hmm, what have we done? We, it appears that we've killed the Son of God. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Zombies. This is real zombie stuff, guys. The Roman officer and the, and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the Son of God. Of God. This morning, we're going to give you three things that Jesus came to do in order to see that remodel completed. And most of it took place within that last few days. Point number one, what he had to come to do, he had to come and lay down his own life. You know, last week we talked about the Old Testament sacrificial system and how every year they would go and they would find a spotless, 
perfect lamb that the high priest would slaughter on the Passover. And Jesus himself said, I'm going to be that lamb of God led to the slaughter. And we talked about last week how the high priest at nine o'clock on the mor- at nine o'clock in the morning would have staked that lamb at the temple. And at nine o'clock in the morning, as Brad just read in our text, Jesus was nailed to the cross. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the high priest would have slit the throat of the lamb, and he would have said, it is finished. And exactly at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus, on the outside of town, said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost, and he became that lamb. They thought to themselves, we have killed the Son of God. We have done this horrible thing. But, you know, I want you to look in John 10, verse 18. I'm going to read out of the NIV. Jesus declares it wasn't them that took his life. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Jesus knew nobody could kill the son of God. Nobody could have taken his life. He willingly laid it down by his own choice, by his own accord, because he knew what the end project looked like. He knew that if he would do this, all of us, could come into a real relationship with him and with his father. Had he not done that, the lamb that was going to be killed year after year after year was only temporary. It was only going to last one year. Jesus said, this is going to be a once and for all. I lay it down. It's going to be over. There were two things the Bible says that he did when he laid down his life. He took the sin of the world and he took the curse that had been placed on the earth in the garden and he, and he took them upon himself. When Brad just read that the soldiers, they took a scarlet robe and they placed it on his shoulders. Well, the Bible tells us back in Isaiah that that scarlet is a representation of sin. So when they put that on them, what they didn't know is they were fulfilling prophecy. When they put that scarlet robe on, he was saying, I take your sins. I mean, the Roman soldiers themselves, he was saying, I take your sins right now as you place this on me and the sins of all humanity for the rest of time, I place it on myself. Then they took and they wove the crown of thorns. And we're not talking like some little sticker bushes. We're talking two inch thorns that if you pricked your finger would put poison into your body and into your bloodstream. They wrapped that crown of thorns. And a lot of times we think that it had a hole in the center. It did not. When you study it out, it would have been completely covering it then they pressed it into his head well if you go back to genesis 3 that we read last week it tells us that thorns represent the curse that was put on the earth when adam and eve sinned and sin was brought into this world so when he put that robe on and he took that crown of thorns and they pressed it into his head and blood began just spread down his body he was saying i'm taking sin and i'm taking the curse upon myself i choose to do this Then, as Brad read so eloquently, in the Hebrew, he said this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the proof in the pudding that Jesus himself had the sin of the world. Because as we talked about before in Isaiah, the Bible tells us, and I want to show you just a quick little picture. A lot of times we think to ourselves, you know, what is the big deal? Why, Why did Jesus really have to come? Why did he really have to give up his life? But see, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that sin separates us from God. And Jesus knew this. And so when he took sin and he took the curse upon him, he literally at that moment felt God turn his back on himself because at that moment he had taken the sin from the very beginning all through humanity upon himself. And God literally cannot look on sin. The Bible says that God doesn't look on sin. It's a barrier between us. And so he turned his back on his own son. And of all the things that happened through the crucifixion, that was the worst for Jesus, that his own father had to turn his back on him. Now, now listen, you have to understand the picture, the house that was built, that religion represented in that time. You, got, you have to understand that in order for them and their relationship with God to, to go to God and to speak to God, they really couldn't do it like we can today. They had to go through man. They had to go through priests. They had to offer sacrifices. If you were here last week, you remember the message, and we talked about the temple and the tabernacle and how people, if they wanted to ask God for forgiveness of their sins, they had to bring animals and sacrifice them. And they had to confess their sins before the people. It was a huge process, and, and it was a wall. 
that had been separating them, just like Misty was saying. There was a wall between man and between God. So when Jesus destroyed that temple, like he said he was going to do, what he was doing is he was destroying the old sacrificial system. He was destroying the old way of doing things. And he said, look, guys, I'm going to kind of wreck and ruin this house, and then I'm going to remodel. This is part of the remodel process. It has to be done. See, that's the big deal with the, with the high priests and with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. That was their business. They were all about collecting uh, all sorts of offerings for, for sacrifices, and, and they had a business wrapped around this offering and the sacrificial system, and he was ruining and messing up the way they thought things should be. So when he destroyed that temple, he was saying, hey, guess what? No longer do I want you bringing the blood of goats and bulls and birds. I want you to come to me. I want you to have a relationship with me face to face. And so when he destroyed it, he opened up a whole new channel by which we could go to God. That's why Jesus, when he was speaking to his disciples, he said, guys, it's better for you that I go now. And they didn't understand. They said, Jesus, why? We're, we're confused. Why do you keep telling us that you have to go? He's saying, it's better if I go because right now I'm just a human. I'm just a man. I'm God man. And, and I can only uh, affect one person at a time. I can only preach to a small multitude of people. But when I go, when I leave this place, I'm going to be able to go to the Father, and he will release the promise of the sweet Spirit of God to come down and fill the inside of each and every one of you so he can fill billions of people over ages and ages and ages of time. So now he's not on the outside, he's on the inside. And we don't have to go through that curtain anymore. So Jesus ripped it from the top all the way to the bottom. That's right. And the third thing that he did when he had, was finishing this, this remodel project is he had to overcome death, hell, and the grave. You know, in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God put a curse of death on them, not only physically, but also spiritually. And when Jesus said in John 19 and 30, he said this, he said, it is finished. That literally meant in that language, it literally meant paid in full. This finished project at that moment, he was saying, I have now overcame death. And you say, well, how do you know he overcame death? Well, because the graves opened up. And those that had served God prior to Jesus Christ dying, they got out, out of their graves. And I mean, honestly, I, when I grew up in church, I don't remember hearing about that until I got older and started studying it, and it freaked me out. I thought, can you imagine, not only when he just at that moment breathed his last, he said, it is finished, Father, unto you I commit my spirit, and all of a sudden it gets dark. It starts to have an earthquake. The temple itself begins to shake and just totally and completely destruct. At that moment, the graves open up. People start walking around. And then the soldier, who is so brilliant, says, Surely this is the Son of God. I mean, what have we done? I mean, it's crazy. But at the same time, Jesus was saying at that moment, I've overcame death. No longer are you going to, you're going to die physically, but you're not going to die spiritually because I have overcame death. And when I return, I'm going to raise up those who have died in Jesus Christ to go on to heaven to have eternal life. No longer when our loved ones pass away do we have to wonder where they will be if they have died in Christ. One day, their body will reunite with their spirit and they will live forever, forever in heaven with Jesus Christ because of that. It also says that he overcame the grave. We know that on that third day, you know, had he just died, it would not have been complete. He would have been an incredible man, an incredible teacher, but he would not have been the Messiah. He would have not finished what he came to do. But when he went into that grave three days later, when that stone was rolled away and he walked out, he overcame the grave. And although they tried to say, you know, the body was stolen, this didn't really happen, we know the truth because I stand here today of a product of religion remodeled. So do you. Just like Jesus, number one, laid down his life, God calls us to lay down our lives. This is what separates us from religion and relationships. Some people say to themselves, I know God, I pray to God, but they don't really know God. They don't have a relationship with God, and that's what he wants. It goes back to that garden experience. If you remember last week, we had a beautiful ficus tree that represented the, the beauty of God's garden. It was pathetic, uh, but, but we took you back to the garden the best we could, and it represented the perfection 
And the beauty of that garden, that eternal place that God had created so that we could walk and talk with him on a daily basis. Because ultimately, that is what God wants out of your life. Are you hearing me this morning? God wants a relationship with you. He doesn't just want your offering. He doesn't just want you to pray. He doesn't want you to just know the scriptures. He doesn't want you to to, to be able to tell people you have a favorite church. It doesn't matter. Those things do matter. But what really, really, really matters is God wants a relationship with you. Not just on Sundays. Not just, uh, you know, maybe once a month. God wants a relationship with you every single day of the week. I talked to a guy in our church, right, this last week. And I gave him a challenge. And I said, look, dude, if you will just make, make it a priority to just pray. I don't care if it's 30 seconds. Just begin your day in prayer. And pray with your wife. Pray with your family. He came to me this week and he said, you will not believe the difference that it made in my life. To literally put God first in my life, he said, everything has changed. All right? So... I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to, can I just, can I reveal the identity here? All right, Mr. Dustin Lawhorn right here. But that's not all. Amen. All right, we've been praying for months with, uh, regarding his relationship with his dad. They, they had, they had just kind of a, a falling, a falling out, all right, in their relationship. And we've been praying for months that God would do something in that relationship. There was some, some, some bitterness, some unforgiveness, just some differences between the two. And I'm telling you, This week, Dustin committed to just putting God first and building his relationship with God and praying every single day. And he called me and he he messaged me and he said, Brad, you're not going to believe what happened. Out of the blue, my dad messaged me and apologized and said, I want to make things right and I love you. (laughs) Guys, this this is the real deal. This This is the real deal. God wants to be the center focus of your life. And when we begin to lay down our lives like Jesus did, and we say, God, it's not about me anymore. It's not about the material things. It's, it's not about how much money I make. It's, 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 not a, it's not about all that stuff that I used to think was so important to me. It's about the fact that I lay myself down before you, and I lift you up in my life. And when you begin to do that, when you make God your priority in your life. I'm telling you that God makes your problems his priority. And he begins to intervene in your life and he begins to get involved. When you act like a child, you have a relationship with your, with your mom or with your dad, and, and they have a relationship with you. And when you want something, it's easy to say, hey, mom, I need your help. Hey, dad, I need your help. But when you come to your dad and he's like, I don't even know you. Who are you? What are you doing in my house? I don't, I don't even know you. You never come to visit. You don't call me. You know, you don't even come over for dinner. What's going on? Yeah. God wants relationship. He's not the candy man. He wants relationship. And guess what? Here's the beauty of it all. You can do it. You can do it. God wired you to do it. But just like I was in, in, in times past, I chose not to do it. Because there were things in my life that... that in that season of my life was more important to me than God was to me. But when I flipped that switch and said, God, you know what? Those things aren't, those things aren't nearly as important as my relationship with you. My life turned around like you can never, ever imagine. You know, the second thing that we have to do if we're going to let God remodel our lives is we have to let go. We have to let go of our past. You know, when Jesus destroyed the temple, which was his second crucial thing he had to do in that remodel project, the Pharisees would never have let go of the old law. They would have never let go of the things that they'd been doing for years and years and years unless God destroyed it. He took that away from them. It took them 46 years to build that temple. They had put their heart, their soul, their money, every piece of their life into it. And all of a sudden, God is saying, no, I want to bring change now. We're going to do away with the temple and everything you used to do and everything that you've been doing all of these hundreds of years. And now you're going to have a relationship. They would have never done it. But Jesus destroyed it. And here's the deal, guys. A lot of times we come to God and we say, I want to lay my life down. I want to surrender it all to you, Jesus. But then we try to hold on to our past. We try to hold on to past relationships that drag us down. We try to hold on to past habits that are bad. We try to hold on to addictions. And we try to say, it's okay. I can hold on to my past. 
can still live for God. And I'm going to tell you right now, you will be miserable every day of your life. Because when God remodels your life, he wants it all. He wants you to surrender it all. And then he wants you to let it go. Because he can't do something new in you if you're always holding on to the old. Do you hear me? You can't do anything new if you hold on to the old. Let it go. Man, that's good. So the third thing that Jesus did is he conquered death in the grave. So how does that apply to our lives? Because guess what? We get to do the same thing spiritually. We, because of what Jesus did by going to that death, and coming up out of the grave, and Misty said it so well, if he, if he only would have died, and that's it. He only would have went down in history as a great man of God, a great prophet of God. Because there were so many others that did the same thing. They were great men and women of God, and they died for that transcendent right. cause. But he not only died, he said, guess what, death? You ain't got nothing on me. And he came out of the grave. And by doing that, he gave us the same power to be overcomers. Yeah. All right, now you guys have heard K-Love, right? I'm an overcomer. I don't even know the words. Stay in the fight till the final. Do you guys like that song? Yeah. That's an awesome song, and it's so true. Right. And that's what we get to gain. That's what we yeah. get to, to take advantage of each and every day of our lives as a believer. When you have a relationship and not religion, when you get out of bed and you set your feet on the floor, you get to say, God, this is the day that you've made. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be glad in it. This day belongs to you, God. It doesn't matter what comes my way. It doesn't matter what happens to me because my happiness is not, is not dependent upon the things that happen in my life. And he has made us overcomers. The word says in Revelation 12 and 11, and they have overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Listen to me. If you have a relationship with God, you can literally say, I am an overcomer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that, that is in the world. The battle before, listen, I, I'm so quickened right now in my spirit because I can just see right now there are so many people in this room that you have a battle that is before you right now and all you can see is with your human eyes. All you can see is that the battle is so huge you can't even begin to wrap your mind around how you're going to make it through this fight. But the battle before you is so much smaller than the God that is inside you. He's so much bigger than that thing that is in front of you, that thing that, that's blocking your way. I'm telling you, God wants to hold your hand through every single circumstance that you're going through in your life. And he can do it right now if you will let him. That's the question, though. Will you let him? Will you stand with me? I'm going to give an opportunity right now for those of you who cannot at this moment call Jesus your king I'm gonna give you the opportunity right now to do that if you would bow your heads with eyes closed who am I talking to this morning who is it that that that's come into this house and, and you have I already see hands coming up <laughs> and, and you have you have put Jesus on the back burner of your life you have made him second or third or fourth or maybe even at the bottom of your list. But he wants to be first. He wants to be Lord of all, master of all. He wants to be your father and he wants you to be his daughter or his son. This morning, I'm going to give you an invitation to receive salvation. You may have even grown up in church but you've never truly had a relationship with the reason why we even have church. That's the one, the only, Jesus. If you know that you are in need of this relationship this morning, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to lift your hand high to the sky, loud and proud, if you want real life change. Are you ready? Here we go, one, two, Three, lift those hands up. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As you're reaching that hand up towards the sky, I want you to imagine that that's your home, that you're reaching towards heaven as your home, that you're reaching towards that place where you're going to meet Jesus in the air one day when we're raptured out of here. Now, right now, with eyes closed, let us pray. Agree with me now as we invite Jesus into our hearts. Father, we love you. We thank you 
for your son. We admit, God, that we have sinned. I have fallen short of your glory. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is Lord. And he is the only one that can truly save me and give me heaven as my home. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I dedicate my life from this moment forward that I will live for him. And I thank you in advance for rearranging my life for your glory. We commend you if you made that decision today. For the rest of you, I want to give you an opportunity right now to just cling to Jesus with everything that you've got. You see what he's done for you. I want you to realize, for those of you who already have a relationship with God, that that power that rescued him from the grave is available to you. So you do not have to go through life, even as a believer, with your head down. You can go through life each and every day, beginning right now, with victory and with peace and with promise. God wants to give you a confidence that is so loud and so awesome, an attitude that will help you to understand that there's nothing, there's nothing, there is nothing that can pull you down. You're going to have trials. You're going to have situations that are difficult. You're going to have problems in this world, but the word says Jesus came and overcame the world. And he's living inside of you now. So let me pray for you that God would give you a mindset of the master. That he would give you an attitude that is so contagious and so empowered with his presence that you see life differently. Would you pray with me now? Father, we are so grateful for your presence, so thankful for your power. Fill us with your presence now, God, that as we leave this place today, that we are contagious Christians, that the love and the honor and the power that fills us because of who you are is overflowing, and that and we come into contact with other people. They can't help but to see how awesome you are. And they don't see us, but they see you. I pray that you would help us to decrease so that you can increase inside of us. God, we love you. We honor you. We give you thanks for you, Jesus, have risen from the grave. And we lift up your name today in adoration and in praise. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Give him amen. praise today for what he has done.